Hello and welcome to ThinkEd TV, our platform for sharing insights, news and the latest in edtech innovation within higher education. I'm Max Oliver, the event director of Ahead by Bet. In this episode, we're discussing the core values of higher education and how these ideas need to be redefined to fit with our ever-changing world. In a new landscape of increased student agency and diverse business models for the sector, it's important that senior leadership teams in universities have the tools to drive core values in education that will benefit future societies. Universities have always been sites of knowledge and research, but we must ensure that today's graduates are particularly informed of the biggest challenges facing the world to improve circumstances for both higher education communities and the planet. In this conversation, we'll be talking about the values good leaders build into institutional culture within higher education. We'll be exploring the importance of sustainability within higher education culture and how you can equip your students and staff with the skills to overcome today's challenges. Let's get started. Our first guest is Carlos Shanka Boasi Diaz, who was recently awarded the Prize of Student Sustainability Champion at the Green Gown Awards, and who joins us to discuss the importance of keeping sustainability at the heart of higher education. In his three years as a student at the University of Bristol, Carlos has forged strong working relationships with sustainability stakeholders, which has enabled him to make huge strides in the ongoing development of the university's sustainability policy and engage his peers in the issues around climate emergency. Carlos, welcome to Think Ahead TV. First off, congratulations on your recent win at the Green Gown Awards. I know you've got the awards sat there with you, um, but can you tell us a little bit more about some of the projects you worked on that helped you secure that award? Sure, thank you very much, Max, for introduction and for inviting me today. Um, well, first off, I would say that I have been involved in many different projects at the same time. So I guess it's more relevant to start with the education side or education for sustainable development. I was part of the Bristol Institute for Learning and Teaching, uh, where I was writing blogs and sort of like doing the, the more research and analyzing case studies within uh, the university, was going well, was not going that well, um, getting involved in the education action plans of the departments. Um, perhaps the most cost-effective campaign that I was leading with other students is the Invest for Change campaign. That was a national-wide campaign in which we were divesting from unethical investments, unethical stocks, and trying to convert our portfolio into a impact, into a sustainable investing portfolio. So that could mean, for example, going from, um, you know, stocks that are related to fossil fuels that are related to tobacco industry etc to more you know renovative economy renewables and so on that was quite a big achievement from our side and we are working with literally multi-millionaire um you know amounts of uh money but the sustainability champions this is a very interesting case study in our university because we literally got the idea and the project from UWE, the University of West England. Uh, by chance, I just joined an event that they were hosting during summer and realized that they were doing a very interesting um, scheme, which consists of having some students championing, basically, you know, representing sustainability in the respective schools and departments. So that went really well. And in our case, we were, were lucky to provide um, a salary for them. So we got 12 sustainability champions for this first year, and this will be a replicated project throughout the, you know, the next years. We're very excited to see what they've been up to. I was also involved in sustainability careers. I really believe that this is a very important side of the higher education sector. We have to ensure that not only we receive some education, but you know, we have the skills and knowledge to be able to you know, go to the job market and know what to do and how to find those you know jobs that, they, that we're more passionate about and then the scope for emissions project which is well the scope for emissions are basically those emissions that you can really control i was also championing as a student 
with the sustainability department and the university to see how best to minimize and mitigate such emissions, which are fairly tricky currently. Perfect. I think those points you touch on are, are, are so great, and I think lots of universities should be should be listening and taking note. Um, but sort of on that, why do you think it's so important for universities to prioritize sustainability? It sounds like University of Bristol really are, um, but why should others? Yeah, well, the most obvious one is, you know, morals, it's ethics, it's being aware and being concerned and taking action towards safeguarding the environment, society and the economy in a positive way, right? If you are aware that univers your university or institution is harnessing is um is damaging the environment sorry you should take you know responsibility but going beyond and uh, because i know that you know oftentimes universities compete with between each other we students and the rest of the world are becoming aware as well and we will care if you know someone is um taking the lead on this side so we're facing global issues from you know we know the energy crisis, food, water, climate, biodiversity, of course, and this will just get worse and worse, I would say, in the next decade. So it's important to invest what we can in the right place, in sustainability, again, economic, environmental, uh, social, and institutions are having a growing incentive to do that in order to, say, sell themselves to the rest of the world. Okay, perfect. Uh, and I think um, you, you touched on it slightly there, and we've spoken a, a little bit there about the role of the institution themselves, but let's flip it to the role of a student and you, and you being a champion for this. Why, why is sustainability relevant to the student? Um, what, could, what can students do to pick up and grasp this and help their, help their relevant institutions yeah. drive towards those goals? Yeah, well, you know, we students are usually fairly young and we are w very aware, I would say even more aware that than most of the adults uh, out there. And at the same time, we're very concerned, currently concerned, because it's our future. When we talk about 2050, I will be 50 years old, I will be 29 years old, uh, sorry, 49 years old. And that's not that ahead. We are going to leave the consequences of climate change as a recurring topic, among others. And, you know, we know that we have to do something right now. So. That's what I mean. That that's what I say. Uh, you know, when I, when I say that universities have to take the lead because we will care. And if there's something that is not going that well, especially in the UK, I think that we have the power to change it ourselves and to champion that. In the case of University of Bristol, I've met loads, and I mean loads of students that are very aware, more aware than I am, um, much more active, more active that, than I am, and that's for a reason because we are the zoomers we are the ones that check the facts and uh, join the global movement movements that we're seeing in so many different cities around the world absolutely i think you're underplaying it there they can't be more active than you carlos i mean they're, <laughs> not, they're not the student sustainability champion um but last but not least let's let's touch on one more thing we've looked at the institution and we've looked at the student now let's look even bigger and what can the sector as a whole in higher education be doing more for sustainability? What are they not doing now that we should be doing more of in the future? Yeah, the number one thing I would say that it's collaboration. Because as a student through my three years involved in education, um, I realized that we didn't have that much connection between all the universities. Bristol is one of the top UK universities and in the UK. But especially, you know, between students unions and other like student groups, not only the, the academic side, there was a big disconnection. So coming back to the example of this, sustainability champions, that was by chance, like I joined the event and they were happy to help. We could replicate the sustainability champions and now have 12 people, 12 students getting paid to enhance sustainability in, in the curriculum. What if, not only UE, not only Bristol Uni, but also Bath, Oxford, Durham, you know, LSD, all of the universities in the UK were more connected and were sharing simple ideas that they are doing and also SUs, also student groups. So 
I think that it's a very, again, cost-effective way of tackling sustainability, right? Enhancing, it would be such a catalyzer to have simple events, simple meetings, say every year, every other month, and simply, you know, discuss and, and, and get to meet each other. That's not something that I wanted to do actually while I was a student, like creating more of a community between SUs within sustainability. Absolutely. Thanks, and I love the idea about the collaboration of student unions. And uh, if you are going to run with that project, I look forward to seeing the development over it over the next coming years. Um, but thanks so much for joining us, Carlos. Once again, congratulations on your great award. Um, and yeah, speak very soon. Thank you. Thank you. We'll soon be speaking to our final guest, Professor Damien Hughes. But first, we're revisiting one of our most popular sessions from our 2022 show, Matthew Said's keynote address in the auditorium of a head by bet. In this session, Matthew applies his arguments of harnessing the power of cognitive diversity and high performance in order to succeed in a complex and volatile world to the higher education sector. He also explores how the most successful teams bring together insights from psychology, anthropology and data science in order to drive innovation, secure a future-proofed environment and unlock untapped potential in your teams. Let's take a look. And I want to finish just by making explicit the link between diversity and growth mindset. You can already see it, right? If you're in a know-it-all mindset, you know, I've been doing this in the... Uh, the higher education sector a long time. I already know everything there is to know. You know, the kind of people who the, an external speaker comes in and they're sat there looking, thinking, why am I listening to this person? I could, you know. If somebody's in a know-it-all mindset, who do they want to surround themselves with? People who think in exactly the same way. This happens to intelligent people. They get stuck in echo chambers can happen in senior leadership teams, academic groups. I'm starting a visiting fellowship at All Souls this autumn, and I'm keen to think about how to get the academics working with others in a systematic way to pursue great science. We're not systematic in the way we do this. It's left to informal relationships based on bumming into somebody at a coffee at a conference. Or two people, a gastroenterologist and an expert in cameras, had a chat across a garden fence because they happened to be neighbors and they created a pill that you could swallow with a camera. You know the thing I'm talking about? We can't leave this to chance. We need Science is gonna be the thing that helps us solve our great problems at an organizational level, but within the scientific community itself, I would argue there is a fundamental lack of science. And this is what I believe we, we really need to get right. But, if, but think about it, in a growth mindset, who do you want to hang around with? In a learn-it-all mindset, do you see you begin to engage with people who are knowledgeable, but who think differently? That's how you learn from them. You begin to build the social skills that enable you to have that curiosity, the exchange of ideas, the constructive dissent, getting out of the comfort zone. I'm delighted to present our final guest today, Professor Damien Hughes. Damien is a visiting professor of organizational behavior and change at Manchester Metropolitan University and is the co-host of the High Performance Podcast, an acclaimed series of interviews with elite performers from business, sports, and the arts, exploring the psychology behind sustained high performance. His innovative and exciting approach has been praised by Sir Richard Branson, Muhammad Ali, and Tiger Woods, to name but a few. Damien, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Max. It's brilliant to be online and chatting with you. Lovely. Um, so to kick off, you've worked with a range of world-class sports teams throughout your career. Um, and I'd love to first start ask you, how you define that term high performing culture, not just within a sporting context, but in a wider sense? Yeah, I think that's a brilliant question, Max. And uh, it's the question that uh, we start every interview that we do on the high performance podcast. And we've done over nearly, or we've done nearly 200 of these interviews today. And what's really interesting is that we've had 200 separate answers to that very question. Now, you might initially hear that and go, well, so what? But I think that's the interesting point to make here, that everybody has their own definition of what high performance means to them. 
And I think that's an important starting point for everybody. I recount, I remember interviewing Phil Neville, the former Manchester United and England footballer. And at the time I met with him, he was the England Lionesses head coach. And we, and we were chatting casually around high performance. And he had this great definition. He said, high performance is doing the best you can with the resources you have in the moment you're in. And that to me is a really brilliant, succinct summary of what I think uh, high performance is because my de- so high performance uh, in terms of doing the best you can, that might be different for you than it is for me. The resources that you have might be different for each of us. The moment that we're in is going to be unique and specific to us as individuals. So my definition of high performance will naturally be different from yours. Now, I think in relation to a team or a culture, I think if you can get everybody to come up with roughly a broad a broadly similar definition of what they consider to be high performance to be. I think that's where you then can start to establish uh, what we call trademark behaviours. You can have standards, you can have the way you communicate that then leads on to understanding how that impacts on a high performance culture. But I think the very starting point is that everybody has to define high performance on their own terms. Absolutely. I think that particular point will resonate particularly with our, our higher education audience as well, yeah. which leads me into, into my second question, really. Um, in your current role as, as a visiting professor at Manchester Metropolitan, um, how have you observed the HE sector changing over the past two years, past two plus years, sort of in that post-pandemic world? Yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating uh, question because we live in fascinating times, don't we? That I think Indeed. I, I, that I can't think of a single industry or sector that hasn't been affected or had to go back and reconsider what they do and how they do it in this post-pandemic world. I like to paraphrase a quote uh, that's attributed to Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, that when he projects forward and people ask him, how do you predict what the trends are going to be in the next 10 years? And he likes to answer that, actually, rather than look and try and guess what's going to happen in 10 years' time, I like to start by saying, what's going to stay the same? And I think when we start to think of higher education from that uh, through that lens of actually rather than worry about what's going to change what's going to stay the same i think the fact that people want to feel a sense of belonging with the with the higher education um, establishment that they go to they want to feel that that they're seen and heard that people recognize their unique talents they want to feel psychologically safe they want to feel that they have some degree of control and autonomy over the environment of where they work best those things were there pre the pandemic and they're there post the pandemic. As humans, we have this innate desire to feel controlled, belong, safe, and that we, and feel valued as well. And I think that the best higher education organizations have really started to turn up the dial on those areas and make sure that they're being addressed. However, they've gone about doing it, whether it's in a, in a, viewing the world through like, uh, through this kind of hybrid model of some face-to-face teaching, some of it being done online. Those factors are still consistently there. Uh, Brilliant. And I think you touch on where I'm going with this next point there as well. I think this uh, this sector is being stress-tested beyond belief, like you say, about hybrid learning, uh, online, in in university learning. What Where are we going next? And I think leading from that, what values do you think that higher education leaders should be embracing to survive this disruption and really thriving with it as well? Well, well, I mean, I love that question around values because I think that that often, that I think what people want more than anything else is they want two things, transparency and consistency. So let me give you a, a parallel example from the world of elite sport that when I go into, say, a dressing room after a head coach has lost their job and the new guy comes in, When you sort of crawl through the debris of that dressing room and you say, what happened with the last guy? Because they were smart and intelligent and really well-intentioned. What was it that cost them the job? And the answer often comes back to one of those two factors. People will either say they weren't clear about the standards and the values of what they held true. Or the second thing is they were clear, but they weren't consistent. So it's often one of those two areas of transparency and consistency. So I think for leaders in higher education, being really transparent around this is the values that we hold, whether that's about integrity, whether that's honesty, whether that's creativity, is one factor. 
but then it's about making sure that that is delivered consistently in pretty much every interaction that a student or a visitor gets to experience in that organization. Nice. I, I think one last point I really want to touch on is about okay. well-being as a topic in itself. And I think probably once again has very many parallels to the sporting world as well. Um, but looking at it, we know that burnout is a huge issue for staff in higher education. And if we look at the flip side and the student, lots of them are struggling with well-being during a very disruptive period. Yeah. I mean, what advice would you have for higher education leaders, again, in developing a constructive institutional culture? Wow, what a brilliant, incisive point you're making there, Max. I think, I think burnout is something that is, 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 is all too close to the surface now for so many. I often think of um, the world of Formula One. If you think of the fastest sport in the world, it's defined by not who drives fastest, but who takes their breaks the most effective. So it's the time in the pit stops that actually determines who's going to win the uh, the Formula One championship. And I think that metaphor is equally applicable for anyone working in higher education. How do you take your time out? You can't get your foot to the pedal all the time, however much the world might seem to demand it of us. So it's about, I think, first of all, being kind to ourselves, learning to accept that that we need to sometimes give ourselves time away from the, from uh, the front to be able to stop, reflect and rest. Um, I, I interviewed um, Joe Wicks, the, uh, the, uh, the fitness guru, uh, a couple of years ago, and he had this great line where he said, a flower can't bloom all year round. And the point he was making there is that it doesn't matter how energised or how passionate you are about your role. You can't always be energized and passionate all year round. So I think when we start by accepting that, that's what I would define kindness as, accepting that sometimes we need time out to be able to refresh and recharge however we choose to do that. So that would be the biggest lesson that I would pass on to that, that I think you can't do that if you're not being kind to yourself. Excellent. I think they're tips not just to take in a professional sense as well, but but in a personal way. Uh circumstance as well. I think lots of people can learn lots from there. Um, Damien, I think that that insight has been invaluable for for certainly me, but I'm sure our audience as well. Um, So I thank you for joining us on ThinkHead TV Um, and definitely looking forward to seeing your session in the Bet Arena um, in March of this year. So I look forward to seeing you there and thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you, Max. It's, a, it's been a real pleasure to, to come and chat with you on this. And equally, I'm really excited to come in at the end of March and meet in with yourself and, uh, and your colleagues and, uh, and the attendees on the day. So thank you for the invite and I look forward to catching up with you then. Excellent. Thanks, Damien. Thanks, Have a lovely mate. afternoon. You too. And that brings us to the end of this episode of ThinkEd TV. We'll be back with a new series of episodes later this year. But first, registration is now open for a head by bet. Join us at the Excel London this March as we continue the conversation on navigating disruption, accelerated digital transformation and the future of higher education. We're also excited to announce the launch of a brand new meetings programme, Connect at Bet, which will offer a unique opportunity to reconnect the education ecosystem. Connect at Bet empowers education buyers to discover the right solutions for their institutions in a fraction of the time and it allows technology providers to find the people within institutions that can unlock the potential of their tech. Connect at Bet will enable thousands of education buyers to meet directly with over 500 global solution providers for more than 5,000 high value 15 minute meetings taking place on site at Bet and ahead by Bet 2023, helping education institutions across the world to reimagine the potential of technology. For more information and to register to attend, visit aheadbybet.com. And that's it from us. You can find more content on the Think Ahead Hub, where we'll continue to share interviews, news and recorded sessions from our events. Check out our social media channels and subscribe to our newsletter for more information. For now, from all of us at Ahead by Bet, thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you at the show in March.